Welcome to the story of cooking. I'm Sarah Nicholas. This season we're filming in the heart of the Shenandoah Valley. I'm here at The Natural Bridge in Natural Bridge, Virginia. And now we're in the kitchen. Um, Godfrey, what you got cooking? To the berry knocker. Berry knocker. Welcome to the Frontier Culture Museum in historic Stanton, Virginia, in the heart of the Shenandoah Valley. This museum is actually old world farms from Europe that were brought over and reconstructed here on site. We are here at the German farm, so let's go inside and see what's going on. So we're here with Gottfried, who is an interpreter at the Frontier Culture Museum at the German farm. How are you today, Gottfried? I'm doing very well, thanks for asking. So this is a farm from where in Germany? Uh, this farmhouse came from southwestern Germany, today called Rhineland Pfalz. Uh, since Germany does not exist as a nation state, it came from one of the principalities called the Palatinat or Palatine, which is part of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. Uh, the museum had started to physically exist in 1988 and was looking for a house from the Palatinat I don't know uh, how it exactly happened, but I know there was a search committee formed. Most likely they approached the German embassy and then the, the government of the Rhineland Pfalz and the historic society were all involved in finding a house and they found this house. And it was actually donated to the museum and then moved over here about 1989 in pieces and then put together again. But this isn't a typical home that would have been built here in America, correct? No. This is from the old world. That's from the old world, yeah. yeah. What would have been the contri like food contributions that the German immigrants at the time would have brought to America? What would you say was be the most significant thing they brought? Mm, certainly, um, they brought uh, their own culture with them. And one of them is the Christmas traditions. Uh, the introduction of a Christmas tree is a typical German idea. Hmm. Um, Martin Luther was the one who right. uh, allowed people to have or said you can have a Christmas tree. And the whole way of celebrating Christmas is strongly influenced by, by the German culture. Uh, the second uh, idea or um, is a musical instrument the Germans brought with them, which is known at that time as the Scheitholt. It is a sitter and it's a strummed instrument. Very late 1700, early 1800, we get another instrument out of that, but this is then made over here, and it's done with the help of the Ulster Scots. Actually, they take over, and we call it the Appalachian Mountain Dolcimum. This is actually not culinary related, but kind of a cool, um, that instrument kind of started like the whole bluegrass yep. music in, in um, yep. the valley. Um, the uh, the dulcimer was the, 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 the music instrument for the settlers along the Appalachian Mountains uh, for their own entertainment, for singing, dancing, also for chanting, uh, religious songs. And the idea of bluegrass was born in Virginia, in southwestern Virginia, by the Carter family. Uh, but that is sort of... Virginia is known for so many cool things. Yeah. I just love it here. So you have to get back to cooking, so I'll let you do that. And maybe um, later we can play some music and enjoy some good food. Yeah, we'll do that. I'll get back to cooking. And when you come back and everything is finished, we'll play some songs uh, from old German folk songs on the Scheitold. And now we're in the kitchen. Um, Gottfried, what you got cooking? We have something which is a, probably very known to all of us. It's Bratwurst and Sauerkraut. Oh, delicious. Which the Germans are very well known for. Uh, the Bratwurst is here that would have been made at home by the farmer, as well as onions, which would have come out of the own garden and the sauerkraut naturally would be made at home um, and stored in the, in the cellar down below. Um, behind me, we're chopping here some liver to make liver dumplings, uh, which is a mixture of chopped liver, uh, breadcrumbs, eggs, spices, and they'd be boiled in a hot beef, a beef broth, uh, and they can be served as a side dish, or they could be served in a soup. Um, and it's also very typical to German uh, food. It gets smoky in here, no? Yes, this is typical for that kitchen. Um, this kitchen is also known in a German language as Rauchküche, um, which would translate into smoky kitchen. 
Um, and the yeah, English so name there's... also be known as Dark Kitchen. You can see here that is all natural from the smoke. Yeah, I'm actually generated. impressed it's not as the smoky, it's not smokier. Uh, it depends on the type of wood we have yeah. and the, the finer the pieces are when you chop them, um, the easier they burn and do not generate as long as. Gotcha. So let's get back to the food. Mm -hmm. So you're cooking obviously on an open um, flame with cast iron skillet? Um, or this, what's that made This of? actually is a frying pan which a, a blacksmith would have made. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is, uh, this is actually, not the handle would be made by the blacksmith. The pan is actually made from brass. Brass, okay. Um, as well as the kettle here is pure copper. Um, also up here, that kettle is copper, but it has a tin surface on the outside. And that would be for protection and for heat transfer as well. So today we're making sauerkraut and bratwurst. Yep. Um, and liver dumplings. How long would that take? Like, what, what would be the typical day? When would you start? This would be like the evening meal? No, uh, you have a warm meal at lunchtime. Great, so what's next? Oh, we're gonna put some of our fried onions uh, into the sauerkraut and then uh, let it cook here for a couple of hours so it gets tender. Um, I have already put some caraway seed in it. Okay. Um, we may put a little bit of salt into it. Uh, depending on uh, the flavor people like. Mm -hmm. um, most interestingly in the old recipes is that there is really nothing given in terms of quantities. Um, in most cases when you see an old recipe of a cookbook 1700 or, or earlier, it says to your liking. Right, yeah. Um, as you like it. Mm -hmm. uh, like, okay, whatever you want, put in there. Season to taste, yeah. that kind of thing, yeah. Well, it and looks great. The rest of the onions are gonna be used also, the um, fat from the bacon to now put the colored greens in it. The leftover bacon grease and a little bit of the onions are now going to be used to saute uh, the colored greens. Would you mind giving yeah, me the, absolutely. the salt colored greens? Right. We're going to just put them in here and then... You never let good bacon grease go to waste. No. It really enhances the flavor. Yeah. And that's what people would have done. In most recipes, you actually see uh, a lot of things done with beef, beef broth or chicken broth or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, and you would make your own stock for, for that You make well. stock for that, yes. Usually out of beef, correct, you said? Um, beef and mostly the, the broth would be made in. So this seems like kind of an elaborate meal. Is this something that you would have had every day? No. You, okay. Uh, that's not a meal for every day. That is something I would you love might to have this every for, day. <laughs> for a holiday. Holiday. Uh, okay. Or a Sunday. Well, uh, this all is looking really good. How it takes about a couple hours, you said, to well, the sauerkraut this? would probably be about two hours at least, um, depending on the type of fire and the heat. We can increase it by adding some uh, pieces of firewood into it. The collard greens wouldn't take much longer. Uh, they just need to be quickly sautéed and then mm -hmm. kept warm. Mm -hmm. That's actually a typical southern preparation today with the bacon and the, yeah. the yeah, yeah, it's one of my favorites. We're going to mix the bacon Can't wait once to taste it done. later. Uh, but it, it's very likely that the Germans would have had that too. Yeah. Uh, and then at the very end of it, uh, the very last and the third one is we're going to make uh, liver dumplings. Mm -hmm. For that we have to chop a lot of liver. Um, and it's a very cumbersome job, as you can see here. Um, She's doing a good job. That is a lot of liver, though. <laughs> well, if you had, you know, six people living in a home and probably strapping young men growing, working on the farm, you'd want yep. a lot of food, so. The, the requirements for calorie intake is enormously larger than our average yeah. how, calorie do you, requirements. That's kind of a weird question, but do you know how many calories you would have had to? Maybe 4,000 to 5,000 Really. Oh. It, it's everything is physical labor. You, know, you start well, from early sense. morning. Yeah. Uh, once daylight is up, you're up and work and working. Mm -hmm. um, Can you imagine us eating 4,000 calories? No. Actually, I you know can't. what? Probably a lot of Americans do, <laughs> <laughs> which is unfortunate. We don't work as hard as you guys used to. Well, it looks good, and I cannot wait to taste it later. And I hope you're going to like it. I know I'm going to love it. Thank you, Gottfried. I'll let you finish up, and I'll come back to taste the finished product. So after a long day of cooking, we have our German feast ready. Can you tell us about, about the food again? Sure. Uh, what you see here in a um, random way is sauerkraut, uh, which we had made here to, at home. 
and it's mixed with uh, bacon and spices. We yeah. have some liver dumplings covered underneath the sour bread and some bratwurst and the green is colored greens on uh, onion sauteed. Um, I hope you like it. Help yourself too. The sauerkraut's delicious. You can really taste it. It's very vinegary. Having trouble cutting this dumpling. These dumplings look a lot like a, a meatball, actually. Mm. Not really what I would think dumplings of. Dumplings are liver dumplings. Um, it's very easy to make. You chop liver, or actually better today, you would grind it and mix it with breadcrumbs and eggs and form dumplings and boil it in boiling water. It has to roll for a few minutes. Um, they may turn harder when they're too long exposed to heat. My favorite color greens, delicious. Mm -hmm. And the last thing? The sausage, yeah. The sausage. Thank you so much, Gottfried. It's been delicious. I'm getting ready to head back to the kitchen to create my own version of a German meal. Why don't you end it with a song? I'll be happy to. kitchen and I'm gonna make my version of calves liver that we cooked on the German farm if you remember on the German farm we had liver dumplings I'm going to make liver pate with blueberry jelly so the first thing we want to do is add bacon to a cast iron skillet and you just want to crisp it up and you're gonna use this bacon grease to cook the rest of your pate ingredients all of them in there. Ah, okay. And you just want that crisp on both sides. Render some of that fat off. So our bacon's in the pan. We're letting that crisp up. And we're actually going to remove the bacon and use the bacon grease to cook our liver and the rest of the pate ingredients. Um, this certainly is a very different way to cook calves liver. A little more modern and um, sophisticated than a dumpling that the German farm made. Not necessarily a German recipe, but certainly another way you can use calf's liver. Those are gonna take a few minutes. Turn up the heat a little bit. All right, the bacon looks good. It's crisp and the fat is rendered in the bottom of the pan. You wanna leave about one to two tablespoons of bacon fat in the pan to cook the rest of your ingredients. So an onion is going in here. Saute that up a bit until it gets a little color and softens. Now because this is a pate, all of this is going to go into a food processor in the end. So you don't have to worry too much about what it looks like. It's all going to be blended together. 
Once those kind of get some color, you want to push them to the edges of the pan, like so. And we're going to add our liver, which is cut about one and a half to two inches um, in strips. Just lay that down in the center of the pan. We're going to take probably about, depending on the thickness of your meat, one and a half to three minutes per side. You want it cooked to medium rare. Flipping it halfway through. Cooking process. Here we go. I'll wash my hands real fast. Again, till it's cooked to medium rare. If you overcook liver, it actually tends to get kind of chalky the texture. It's not very pleasant to eat. Okay. Let's go ahead and add our garlic and herbs just into the pan. Throw it all in there. We have garlic and we have some rosemary. So a lot, a lot of flavors other than calf's liver going in here, which I think helps. I like liver, but I only like it certain ways with a lot of other stuff in it. Okay, some rosemary, fresh rosemary, or sorry, fresh thyme, fresh rosemary already went into the pan. Just peel it off its stem. And you can add as much as you like. These two flavors are kind of classic with liver pate, the rosemary and the thyme. Let's add one more. And you could use dried. Fresh is always better. Dried is perfectly acceptable. Okay. See what it looks like. Let's try to give it a flip. Not quite there yet. So these look about three minute per side liver strips. That looks about medium rare and you can really smell that rosemary coming off the pan. It smells really good. The next step is to take your bacon and crumple it over top because that's going in the pate mixture as well really helps. And we're just going to turn that off the heat, turn the heat off, excuse me, and remove it from the heat. Let it cool for a little bit before we throw it in the food processor. In the meantime, we are going to make our blueberry jelly, which is so simple. Just turn on your heat and add your blueberries. Fresh is better. Frozen will work. Sometimes you actually need to add a little water if you have fresh. It just kind of helps them like soften and break down, which I'm going to do to expedite the process. Just a little water. And they shouldn't take long, just until they kind of plump and soften. And I think blueberries is also a very classic thing to put with liver. You see it a lot in French cooking. Okay. It's going to take maybe 30 more seconds. You can see they're already kind of starting to pop in the heat. That's what we want. And also, it did, I would taste your blueberries before you actually um, put them in the pan. If they're not very sweet, sometimes you might want to add a little bit of sugar. But I kind of like the tart tartness of the blueberries without the sugar with the liver. Okay, these are about to where we want them. They're soft. We're going to take these off the heat. Ideally, you let them cool a little bit. We're going to put them in the food processor to puree them. Throw them right in there. Okay. Mix those up. And this is this is gonna be a jelly, so you don't want it to be too chunky. You want it really pureed. 
to make a jelly, we need gelatin. And you just take a packet of gelatin and three tablespoons of water and let it bloom. Stir it. Till it's dissolved. Sit for a few seconds there. Let's make sure this is nice and smooth. Remove it from the food processor and put it back into your pan. Also, turn the heat off. It needs to be warm. Okay. And you're going to actually put your gelatin into the blueberry mixture while it's still warm, but off the heat. Stir it in till it dissolves. Simple as that, you just want to keep it off the heat because you want it to cool. And as it cools, it will become more jelly-like. I'm going to get the blender cleaned up because I need to put the pate mixture in the blender. Blend that with one and a half packets of cream cheese. Blend it all together and that will be your pate. I'm going to get everything cleaned up and when we come back, we're going to assemble them in ramekins. So I've topped the pate with the blueberry jelly. I've let it cool in the refrigerator for about an hour and a half until the jelly sets and the pate is completely cooled. I think the best way to eat this is with a crostini. And you kind of use it as, you know, like a, a dip, I guess you would say. You just spread it on the crostini. You can see the blueberry jelly in the pate. It's really good. The blueberry jelly helps. The bacon certainly helps. You've got that little minerally flavor from the liver, but it's not overpowering. I would highly recommend it for a party. And it's pretty, it's purple. It's great to serve at a party. It makes a beautiful presentation with the blueberry jelly. I highly recommend it. Thank you for joining me on the story of cooking. I'm Sarah Nicholas. Until next time, keep the story going.